Welcome to Lecture 19, the final lecture for Chemistry 418. The readings for this lecture are from Nuclear Forensics. Plutonium isotopics provide excellent signatures for nuclear. Continuing with plutonium-238, this isotope can also... The isotopic distribution of plutonium is also influenced. A key signature that can be obtained from plutonium isotopics is an evaluation of the reactor type that was used to produce the plutonium. This is achieved by evaluating ratios with plutonium-240. For instance, the mass between the plutonium-240 and plutonium-239 can be evaluated. This is usually done with mass spectroscopy. And then the overall activity of plutonium isotopes where the plutonium-238 is measured and plutonium-239-240 alpha spectroscopy data is provided. And a ratio of the 238 to the 239 plus the 240 is used. Plotting this is shown here where the plutonium-238 divided by the plutonium-239 plus plutonium-240 activity is plotted against the 240 and 239 mass. What's shown here, and this is uh, varied reactor types at 37.5 megawatts per ton, is shown that you can even evaluate differences between pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors, although the difference isn't that great. However, it can be, um, it can be observed. And here's your nominal composition of weapons-grade plutonium. If you look at the plutonium-240 to 239 mass, over here would be weapons. Here would be more reactor conditions. But what is very evident is the differences between the light water reactor types and the heavy water reactor type that can do, and then the differences further still between the reactor types and a blanket. So by looking at these activity and mass ratios for the plutonium isotopes, one can get an idea of the reactor that was used to produce the plutonium. The plutonium isotopics can also be used to determine the time that the sample sat in the reactor for the irradiation. And in this case, one uses the plutonium-239 concentration, so, con uh, so activities, or excuse me, atom amounts, atom ratios are provided uh, against plutonium-239. As we see here, we have the 240-239 ratio, the 241-239 ratio, and the 242-239 ratio. In all these cases, as we go up in A, we see a decrease in the ratio as expected. But one sees a certain trend of radiation lengths from days, from 10 days to approaching 1,000 days with the ratio. And this makes sense where you get a buildup of the heavier plutonium isotopes at longer radiation times. Plutonium-241 is time sensitive, since it has a relatively short half-life, it can also provide information about the time since discharge. So this could be a key measurement. As you can see, it's very sensitive to the length of irradiation, plus it'll provide information based upon the decay plutonium-241 to americium-241. You can use that as a dating type signature for how long their material's been outside of the reactor. Reactor power can also be evaluated through plutonium isotopics. Again, mass, 242 to 239, and then the activity of the 238 divided by the 239 plus the plutonium 240 ratio. So this is a similar term to what we've evaluated before. This is a different mass, and we have to multiply it by 100 here, so we need rather sensitive instrumentation. But what we see for low reactor power, the variation is much greater for the activity ratios, not so much for the mass ratios. However, there's this regime where we go from 10 uh, megawatts per ton all the way up to you know close to 1,000, or in this case, just a couple hundred megawatts per ton. We certainly see a pronounced regime change where the determining ratios can, uh, for both these routes can provide. The transplutonium isotopes can also provide information. 
An example of these isotopic ratios we've just discussed is shown here. So if one looks at the americium isotopic ratios, and this is for 6% 240 in a, uh, a, a, in a sample with plutonium, we see that this ratio decreases as the thermal power increases. Right, so we can go from 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 thermal megawatts per ton of reactor power. And from this, measuring this isotopic ratio of the americium isotopes provides a route for determining the reactor thermal power, which then tells us information related to where the reactor origin was for the production of the material. Same thing if we find plutonium, that is 6% 240, and the curium isotopic ratio is evaluated. We see a different trend between the 244 and the 240. We see that obviously as the thermal reactor power increases, we produce more curium 244 in relative terms, and this ratio goes up. And again, this is a mass ratio. So if one were to do activities, one would have to convert that to masses, or by a mass spec, one could perform these measurements. There's another example of a ratio that can be used, the curium 244 to americium 243 ratio, but we see that it's not as sensitive over the entire regime, over the entire energy regime. You only get some slight changes between 100 and 1,000 megawatt thermal per ton. So it's not as sensitive as a signature. Information on reprocessing techniques, routes, and methods can also for solvent extraction processes, the main one that has been used historically, similar to what we discussed about the fission products, the transuranic isotopes can also be produced during the production of plutonium. And the materials can also provide signatures, as we've previously discussed. So as an example, if one produces one gram of plutonium, that is 6% by mass plutonium-240, one can expect the isotopes of neptunium, americium, and curium to be present. Their relative masses can be listed here. So per gram of plutonium produced, you would expect these masses of the other isotopes to be produced. So some, the, uh, for instance, curium-244, we're talking on the order of nanograms being produced, relatively small amount. But since the half-lives are short, the activity is listed here in decays per minute can vary on the order of 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 9th per gram of material. That's unseparated material. So obviously when the material is separate, um, is treated and plutonium purified, you get lower amounts of these um, activity of these isotopes. However, incomplete separation provides a route for determining signatures in this material. During the treatment and reprocessing of radioactive material, we're going to conclude this lecture with discussion of some very general signatures and the behavior of neutrons and devices is important and provides a route for some other signatures that you would see with plutonium material with that. Now there's also a uh, nuclear. In this lecture, we reviewed signatures that are germane to nuclear forensics, particularly isotopic ratios plutonium isotopic ratios, americium isotopic ratios, curium isotopic ratios are particularly useful in determining the origin of the material of plutonium containing material, the length of an irradiation, the type of reactor in which it was irradiated in. We also discussed um, some general overviews of devices and how those are germane to nuclear forensic signatures. So as an example, some questions you should be able to answer. What signatures are available from plutonium isotopics? Well, the plutonium isotopic ratio can give very valuable information about where the plutonium was generated. If one evaluates the plutonium-238 to 239 to 240 activity divided by the 240 to 239 mass, one can find out if the plutonium came from a light water reactor, either a pressurized water reactor or a boiling water reactor a heavy water moderated natural fueled reactor, a can do, or a blanket, which is uranium that's outside of the main reaction uh, reactor zone that's used for capture of 
uranium to plutonium. This, if one were to have a look at some obtained plutonium material, evaluate these isotopic by mass and activity ratios, see where it lies. One could, first of all, determine if it's designed for weapons use by the nominal 6% plutonium 240 composition. And then look at where it came from. So what type of reactor? And this is important because um, if it came from a can-do, you can identify the locations. Uh, there are a limited number of can-dos that are available for producing this material. Or a blanket type material would tell you what sort of reactor design. What material can be alloyed with plutonium? Well, if one goes back to the plutonium lecture, you'd see that there's a host of material that can be alloyed with plutonium. But for forensics applications, it would be gallium that's used for uh, an alloy of plutonium. And why do neodymium fission products uh, isotopics differ than the natural? This is primarily driven from neodymium. One. Not only can isotopic information give you uh, data related to what type of reactor produced the material of question, but you can also get an idea of how long that material sat in the reactor. So what kind of uh, information can you use to determine material radiation time? Well, the plutonium isotopes provide great information on that. You'll see an increase in heavier plutonium isotopes with time. So plutonium-239 as it sits in a reactor, one it's fissioning, and two it's capturing, so plutonium-240, plutonium-241, etc. So the relative concentration of plutonium-239 decreases with time. And what one can do is evaluate the atom ratio of different plutonium isotopics. Everything normalized to the 239. The values continually increase as the length of irradiation increases. So the atom ratio can go anywhere from uh, a number greater than 0.1 to values well under uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 5. The other information that you can get from this is actually related to how long the plutonium has been out of the reactor. And this has to do with the plutonium-241 isotopes information. This has a relatively short half-life, the plutonium-241 isotope. So if one were to have a sample and identify the irradiation uh, time from the 240 to 239 ratio, 242 to 239 ratio, you would have two data points that would indicate a time. You could evaluate the 241 to 239 ratio. Any decrease in the relative amount of plutonium-241 can be identified. The isotope plutonium-241 is a 14.29 year half-life. So by taking the data points, which would give you the irradiation dates from the 240, 239, 242, 239 ratio, you'd be able to determine what should have been the plutonium-241, 239 ratio at the end of the irradiation. You can measure what it is today, and one could use the half-life of 14.29 years to determine the length of time it's been out of the reactor. Now you can imagine that this is only sensitive for samples that have been out for a time period that's on the order of a half-life. Other information that one can get is related to fission products and what sort of signatures can they provide. Well, for separations... Congratulations on completing the 19th and final lecture for Chemistry 418. This lecture was on nuclear forensics. When you've completed this lecture, please respond to the 19th PDF quiz and comment on the blog. And we'll end this lecture with Zombie by Fela Kuti.